أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان العين الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين Chapter 21 from The Reign of Quantity and the Signs of the Times by Rene Genon, Sheikh Abdul Wahid Yahya, Rahimah Allah This chapter is entitled The Significance of Metallurgy This is a further and con- this is a, c- a continuing elaboration. These chapters from chapter 17 onwards up to now are a continuing <coughs> elaboration upon the theme introduced, or the concept introduced in chapter 17, namely the solidification of the world. In um, chapter 20, he talks about the geometrical symbolism of solidification in terms of moving from sphere to cube and then in chapter 21, he looks at the significance of this ancient symbolic story of the murder of Abel by Cain as a further manifestation of, or further, yes, a further symbol of solidification. Now, in both of those chapters, he makes brief mention of metals and metallurgy. And when he made that first um, brief mention in chapter 20, I said, make a note of that in my lecture on chapter 20, from sphere to cube. And there what he was talking about is how the cube symbolizes earth and is a kind of maximum of stability and solidification and belongs to the corporeal order. And that in the corporeal order, the actual things which are a maximum of solidification are the metals. Okay, then in <coughs> chapter 21, he talked about how Cain, as symbolic of sedentary man, um, in addition to symbolizing fixity, fixation, uh, immersion in fixity in space, immersion in time, also implies the development of metals and metallurgy. And so he wants to speak now about this in chapter 22, about how metals and metallurgy have a certain significance. What is that significance? Obviously, the significance is a further example of the solidification of the world. Especially in, for example, building, the realm of architecture. Primordial man in the previous yugas would have built no structure, would have lived out in the open then the first kind of structures would have been very simple. <clears throat> they would have been completely integrated into the natural order, something like a hut or a natural thing like a cave or you know, the kinds of things that, that maybe Taoist or hermits uh, would inhabit. And what would be, have been constructed would have been sacred kind of temples, some, and those would have been made of stone. Un- hewn or uncut stone, stone which had not been touched by metal. Again, we'll talk about this in the chapter. And then later we have metal coming in. And nowadays there's a lot of glass and metal and concrete that is involved in building. And all of this, particularly the use of metal, is extremely disconcerting to get on. It is in fact malefic, malevolent, satanic, and demonic. Let's see why. Chapter 22, The Significance of Metallurgy. We have seen, says Genon, that the arts or crafts that involve the direction of activity toward the mineral kingdom belong properly to the sedentary peoples, in other words, those symbolized by Cain, and that such activities were forbidden by the traditional laws of the nomadic peoples, of which the Hebrew law is the most generally known example. It is indeed evident that these arts tend toward solidification. And in the corporeal, corporeal world, as we know it, solidification, in fact, reaches its most profound forms, form in minerals as such. You already said this in chapter 20. Moreover, minerals in their commonest form, that of stone, are principally used in the construction of stable buildings. A town, considered as the collectivity of the buildings of which it is made up, appears in particular as something like an artificial agglomeration of minerals. 
And it must be reiterated that life in towns represents a more complete sedentarism than does agricultural life. <laughs> Just as the mineral is more fixed and more solid than the vegetable. But there is something more. This is where Ganon is getting to the heart of the matter. The arts applied to minerals include metallurgy in all its forms. So metals and metallurgy are symptoms of the solidification of the world. Now, the evident fact, he says, that metal tends increasingly in these days to be substituted for stone in building, just as stone was formerly substituted for wood, leads to a supposition that this change must be a symptom, he says, of a more advanced phase in the downward movement of the cycle, in other words, in the solidification of the world. Now, Ginnon believes that well, Ganon believes that this, this, this supposition of his is substantiated by the fact that, in a general way, metal plays an ever-growing part in the industrialized and mechanized civilization of today. And that from a destructive point of view, if it may be so expressed, no less than from a constructive point of view, for the consumption of metal brought about by modern wars is truly prodigious. And of course, what Ganon says here is very true regarding uh, not only modern architecture, but definitely modern warfare, if you think about it. It's all metal. <laughs> Bullets are mainly lead. Um, mortar rounds. And if you also think about it, there's also um, depleted uranium, kind of armor-piercing shells. It's all the realm of... of, of, of of minerals, of metals. Um, so here on page 153, having made that observation about the modern industrial mechanized world and the prodigious consumption of metal by modern wars, he returns to this idea in the Hebraic tradition about how no metal may be used in the construction or the employment of stones being used uh, employed for the construction of temples or of the temple. The prohibition of the use of metal was thus more especially strict in the case of anything intended to be put to a specifically ritual use. Um, so according to get on that, this is even true in the case of the continuing use. I don't, they certainly still don't do it, but the, the, for a long time, apparently the use of a stone knife even for the rite of circumcision, uh, which obviously is a ritual, and so a ritual use. Traces of this prohibition, in other words, against metal tools and implements, according to Ganon, still persisted even when Israel, he means the children of Israel, the children of Jacob, had ceased to be nomadic and had built or caused to be built stable edifices. <clears throat> when the Temple of Jerusalem was built, the stone was prepared at the quarry so that neither hammer nor axe nor any tool of iron was heard in the temple while it was being built. So all of this, according to Ganon, points to the problematic character of uh, metallurgy and the use of metals. Now there is a problem here, though. And that is that the metals are not completely malefic. They're not completely an evil. There is a benefic element as well. It's, and he makes this point on the next, um, on the next page. And that is that uh, just as there is benefic influences and malefic influences from planets, the same is true of metals. And the metals have planetary correspondences and are a kind of concentrated form of the planet. Uh, he talks about this on page 154, but he is of the view that the malefic aspect of metals and metallurgy dominates at this point in the yuga. So at the bottom of page 153, two lines up from the bottom of the page, he says, nevertheless, on the other side, metallurgy has been specially revered in some traditional forms. So I can tell you that there are plenty of traditional forms. So for where, where metallurgy or some form of metallurgy is, is ritualized, its, its malefic aspect is controlled. Um, so 
in Japan, when a sword is forged, it is a Shinto ritual. Um, the the workshop, so to speak, of the swordsmith is a sacred space, and there are Shinto symbols. I've been to these places in Japan. I went to meet a swordsmith, and they hang a, a length of rope, and there is some sort of a paper talisman, if I may call it that. I'm not sure about all the symbolism of those things, but, but the forging of a sword is a symbolic act, and the instructions are never written down. There's no element of quantification where, oh, well, what temperature should the water be when you plunge the, you know, the heated iron of the first beaten out blade? Um, when do you stop? It's all qualitative. There's no quantitative element, and the whole thing is the sacred ritual. Um, Uh, much could be said, uh, obviously, about sacred weapons and so forth. And Genon has spoken about that, but we don't want to get off a topic. So there is another side of metallurgy, and that metallurgy has been revered in some traditional forms and has even served, he says, as the basis of very important initiatic organizations. <clears throat> it must suffice to quote, he says, in this connection, the instance of the Kabiric Mysteries, this is the top of page 154, two lines down with a K. Without dwelling longer at this point on a very complex subject that would lead much too far afield, all that need be said for the moment is that metallurgy has both a sacred aspect and an execrated aspect, and that in their origin these two aspects proceed from a twofold symbolism inherent in the metals themselves. Now he's going to talk about this twofold symbolism. He just mentions what these Kabiric Mysteries, he doesn't say what they are. So this is a reference to a group of kind of enigmatic, chthonic deities in ancient Greece known as the Kaberoi, and that can be spelled with a K or with a C. They are associated with Samothrace and what are known as the Samothracian mysteries, which were rites held in honor of the goddesses Demeter, Persephone, and Hecate. Um, these Kaberoi are um, uh, the sons of the god Hephaestus, Hephaestus, if I'm pronouncing it correctly, and the point is that they were famed as metal workers, and they were actually the sons of Hephaestus, but they were dwarves. So you'll find later that the, these people who are involved traditionally with metal and, and these chthonic or tenebrous subterranean, you know, under the earth, kind of beings or entities are either dwarves or giants. Uh, and he just sort of drops this reference and doesn't elaborate on it as Gennon often does, and he expects you to know this stuff. So, to transition to the next paragraph, he introduces these Kaburai just in passing, and he's simply telling us that metallurgy has a sacred aspect and an execrable or execrated aspect, a benefic and a malefic and this is related to the symbolism of the metals themselves. What is that symbolism? Well, it's that the metals, in the next paragraph he says, by reason of their astral correspondences, you know, to the stars, are in a certain sense the planets of the lower world. So silver is associated with the moon. Gold is associated with uh, the sun. Lead is associated with um, Saturn. And so they're the planets in a certain sense of the lower world, and naturally, therefore, they must have, like the planets themselves, of which they can be said to receive and to condense the influences in the terrestrial environment, a benefic and a malefic aspect. Then there's a footnote here about Zoroastrianism, which um, is not really too important. You can read that. It'll, it's just it's a digression. Furthermore, he continues, since an inferior reflection is in question corresponding to the actual situation of the metallic mines in the interior of the earth, the malefic aspect must readily become predominant, and it must not be forgotten that from the traditional point of view, metals and metallurgy are in direct relation with the subterranean fire, the idea of which is associated in many respects with that of the infernal regions. Nonetheless, if the metallic influences are taken in their benefic aspect by making use of them in a manner truly ritual, in the most complete sense of the world, word, they are susceptible of transmutation and sublimation, and are then all the more capable of becoming a spiritual support. So his point is that nowadays, metals are not mined and used in a sacred fashion. And so the malefic dimension will uh, necessarily dominate. There are, in the Islamic occult sciences, for example, the use of metals. 
Uh, for example, a, the royal sort of talisman is inscribed on a sheet of gold. Um, it would be a 6x6 six six magic square, adding to 111 vertically, horizontally, and diagonally. 111 is the Jafar, it's the Abjad of um, Qutb, which means axis. It also corresponds to the word Alif. Um, so there's a, there's a proper way of using these things, but most people don't know how to do this anymore. And certainly in the modern world, they just mine the stuff. Gold is simply held for its value. It's used in you know, various things. There's actually, a certain amount of gold is used in mobile phones. In other words, there's a completely profane, utilitarian, quantity-based um, uh, employment and exploitation of these metals that has nothing to do with ritual. And mining them and extracting them from the earth, according to Genon, also results in the release of certain subterranean, tenebrous, chthonic, uh, infernal uh, energies or entities or influences which are part and parcel of the solidification of the world. Now, you can notice this if you sit down in a modern city like New York. It has a very different vibe than the traditional part of a traditional city like Fez in Morocco or Isfahan, for that matter. It's a very, very different vibe, if you want to use a very modern American expression. A more elevated expression would be, it has a completely different ambiance, a completely different spiritual ambiance. There is an overall sort of uplifting and upward vibration, if I may use the term, a sattvic tendency to, 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 uh, use the um, uh, terms from the Vedic tradition, an upward thrust or pull, if you like. Whereas in the modern world, in a place like New York or Chicago, it is very metallic. It is very industrial. It has the opposite tendency, a tendency of dragging one down, of becoming mired in materiality and the corporeal realm. It is, to say the least, not a very inspiring or enlightening environment. The ambiance is overall oppressive, morose, and lugubrious. Page 155. On the other hand, when nothing is in question but the profane utilization of metals in view of the fact that the profane point of view as such necessarily brings with it the cutting off of all communication with superior principles, nothing is then left that is capable of effective action save the malefic side of the metallic influences. And this will develop all the more strongly because it will inevitably be isolated from everything that could restrain it or counterbalance it. This particular instance of an exclusively profane utilization is clearly one that is realized in all its fullness in the modern world. So, this is Genon's view. Now, so far, so so far, he's been talking about this solidification of the world, um, and its endpoint being, namely, the reign of quantity. But in this reign of quantity, the use of metals is only one aspect. Uh, but according to Genon, it is this aspect that is obviously manifested in all fields up to the phase at which the world has now arrived. Remember, he's writing in 1945. Uh, but Genon says that things can and only will get worse. He says, but things can go further yet, and the metals, by virtue of the subtle influences attached to them, can also play a part in a later phase leading more directly to the final dissolution. And obviously he will elaborate on this further in the book, but for the now he says... During the course of the period that may be called materialistic, these subtle influences have undoubtedly passed more or less into a latent state, like everything else that is outside the limits of the purely corporeal order. But this does not mean that they have ceased to exist, nor even that they have entirely ceased to act, though in a hidden manner of which the satanic side of mechanistic theory and practice, especially but not solely in its destructive applications, is after all but a manifestation. 
though naturally the materialists can have no suspicion of the fact. These same influences then need only wait for a favorable opportunity to assert their activity more openly, of course always in the same malefic direction, because so far as benefic influences are concerned, the world has, so to speak, been closed to them by the profane attitude of modernity. Moreover, their opportunity may no longer be far distant, be very far distant, for the instability that nowadays continues to increase in every domain shows clearly that the point corresponding to the greatest effective predominance of solidity and materiality has already been passed. What Genon is really saying is that through this domination of metal and the, and the mining and liberation of these metals from the subterranean realm, he isn't really using the word, but basically malefic jinnic influences, influences of a malefic occult, meaning hidden nature, have been unleashed onto the world. And anyone who lives in the modern world, who has even a modicum of spiritual sense, can see this that this is the overall zeitgeist, it is the spirit of the time, it is really the energy, so to speak, that is out there. Anybody who who saw even a glimpse, and I saw only a glimpse and it was sufficient, of the opening ceremonies of the recent summer games in Paris, <clears throat> was a truly, truly uh, pronounced and shocking example of the hideous character of the influences which have now um, possessed the minds of most people. <clears throat> now, in, in summing up, he introduces another theme, and that is about metals in relation not only with the subterranean fire, but also with hidden treasure. Now, it's very interesting that in the Islamic occult sciences and throughout in, in ancient Egypt as well, there was a lore about hidden treasure. This, this theme comes up in um, popular Arabic literature in the medieval period, what is called the Thousand and One Nights. No, this is not high literature. This was never considered, but it was kind of popular stories and so forth. The idea of, of, of a cave of treasures. Um <clears throat> In ancient Egypt, there's also this idea, there's ancient Egyptian texts. Often various things were buried, uh, and um, various um, occult means were used to secure those treasures from being discovered, and if they were discovered, that malefic influences would be unleashed. So there is this lore of hidden treasure, and buried treasure. Uh, in ancient Persian symbolism, this buried treasure is always guided by a serpent. A serpent is always symbolic in the Islamic context of jinnic, jinnic influences. So he talks here about hidden treasure. It may facilitate the understanding of what has just been said. In other words, all that stuff he said about malefic influence. If it is pointed out that according to traditional symbolism, the metals are in relation not only with the subterranean fire as already indicated, but also with the hidden treasure. All these matters being rather closely interwoven for reasons that cannot possibly be developed here, but that can go some way toward explaining how it is that, hum that human interventions are capable of provoking, or more exactly, of releasing certain natural cataclysms. However that may be, all the legends, quote-unquote, using the language of today, he says, about these treasures show clearly that they're guardians, who are none other than the subtle influences attached to them, are psychic entities, I would call them jinn, that it is extremely dangerous for anyone to approach who has not got the required qualifications and does not take the necessary precautions. So this idea that a treasure always has some sort of a serpent or a dragon associated with it. There's a famous uh, line of poetry from one of the ghazals in Persian of, of um, Saadi of Shiraz that says, Ganj o mar o gul o khar o gham o shadi Baham and, meaning that it says um, Ganjumar, the treasure and the serpent, the rose and the thorn, bliss and sorrow are intertwined. In other words, buried treasure always comes with, always comes with psychic entities that are its guardians, 
and they're extremely dangerous to be involved with. So obviously modern people have no idea about taking any precautions about these things. Even though they constantly boast, Ganon says, about conquering nature and the forces of nature, they really have no idea what sort of forces are actually at work in what they call nature. <clears throat> Finally, he says, uh, two lines up from bottom of page 156, and then the chapter concludes on 158. It will be as well to add here, incidentally, a further note on something that may perhaps seem to be only a singularity or a curiosity, but will furnish the occasion of some further remarks later. Again, it's the same theme, the guardians of the hidden treasure. Uh, these guardians of the hidden treasure are at the same time, according to Genon, the smiths working in the subterranean fire and are represented in different legends, sometimes as giants and sometimes as dwarfs. Again, these are jinn, jinn, in my understanding... These are jinn. Jinn are cap. They are shapeshifters. They are capable of appearing very small, and they are capable of appearing to be very large. In other words, as dwarves or as giants. Um, so he says that there is a possibility of taking such symbolism and giving it a positive or benefic um, interpretation. And once again, he returns to these kabiras from ancient Greece. Um, but. <clears throat> According to Genon, the conditions in which we live now in this stage in the Kali Yuga are not very conducive, and the infernal aspect, in other words, dominates. He says the said conditions are no more than an expression of influences belonging to the inferior and tenebrous side of what may be called the cosmic psychism. And as will appear more clearly as this study proceeds, influences of this sort and their multitudinous forms are today actively threatening the solidity of the world. That is the chapter he's alluding later in the study to uh, chapter 25, the fissures in the Great Wall, the intrusion of jinnic demonic influence. Finally, he says, to complete this short summary, one more point related to the malefic aspect of the influence of metals must be mentioned. Now, this is something which is very strange. I've never heard about this in the Islamic context, and he seems to imply that this is done in the Hajj, but that is the uh, prohibition which one frequently encounters in traditional societies against the carrying of metallic objects uh, in certain states of ritual consecration or in, in times when certain rituals or sacred acts are being performed or uh, initiatic rites are being performed. Um, and he says that apparently this is uh, something which is there in the Hajj as well. I've been on the Hajj before. I'm not really sure. Maybe it has to do with the idea that you can't engage in warfare in Hajj, so you're not going to be carrying around swords, um, lances, you know, spears, things like this that have metal points or, or bladed weapons of various kinds. Um, and then he talks about how there are certain people uh, who are very saintly, and they cannot, because of the spiritual state particular or peculiar to them, they are unable to bear or endure the least contact with any metal or metallic object. Um, that's a very peculiar and, and fascinating phenomenon. I have never myself experienced it or encountered it. Um, and uh, it's a very interesting thing that he's saying. And that's how he's concluding the chapter. I, again, I don't know anything about this. If anybody has read accounts of this or has uh, concrete examples of this in other religious and spiritual traditions, I would find that very interesting. Please do put that in the comments. Um, so again, this is how he concludes that there's this incurable blindness in modern civilization towards the release of these tenebrous, chthonic, subterranean, uh, psychic entities uh, due to a kind of indiscriminate um, and widespread employment of um, metals, uh, mining, metallurgy in modern civilization. And this is um, yet another dimension, albeit perhaps a darker one, and a darker side of the solidification of the world. Thank you very much for watching. Please do not forget to like, subscribe, and share.